Hello and welcome to chapter 3 of Costanzo's physiology textbook. In this chapter we're going over neurophysiology. We're going to split this chapter up into several portions starting off with the basics, then getting into our sensations and pain, going through all of our actual senses, so vision, hearing, taste, etc. And then we'll finish it off with the motor systems as well. So in this video we're going to start off with the basics, something nice and simple for you. And if you're in need of the textbook you can find a link within the description where you can also find a link to our Patreon account where you can support the channel and get access to downloadable audio files of every chapter. So let's dive straight into it with the definition of the nervous system, which is really just a way an organism is able to communicate with its environment. We have two portions to the nervous system. We have the central nervous system that includes everything from the brain to the spinal cord. And then we have our peripheral nervous system, which is everything that really comes out of the spinal cord to your periphery. And then it can be divided further into our sensory or motor divisions. Sensory is the way that we are able to sense our environment, so obviously all the inputs into your central nervous system. Another word for this is your afferent division. Remember, beginning with A, the first letter of the alphabet, so it is the input division, versus the motor division, which is the output division. That's how we interact with the environment by moving our muscles, etc. This is the efferent division. E coming after A. So clearly we're going to get a signal from the environment through the afferent division, goes to the central nervous system, gets processed, and then however we want to respond to the environment gets sent out through the efferent division. So we can look at our nervous system and mainly our central nervous system further looking at these diagrams here. This diagram on the left gives us an actual depiction of what the central nervous system looks like and then this one over here on the right gives us more of a schematic diagram turning the each grouping of systems into little boxes so if we start off with the cerebral cortex that is just the meat of the brain that we always think about so this really highly convoluted tissue which is clearly involved with more complex type of reasoning that is what allows us to think choose how we respond to our environment gives us our emotions etc and is where consciousness is thought to derive from underneath the cerebral cortex there is our thalamus you can see it down here. The thalamus is almost like the sorting center in a post office. So it is actually receiving signals from all over the place and then sending it to the right location. So it's receiving a lot of signals from below, from the spinal cord, and then deciding where it's going to send it to, where in the higher senses, where in the cerebral cortex is it going to go. It's also going the other way too, where it is receiving signals from the cerebral cortex, sorting them, deciding where to send it out through the output systems. So your thalamus is like a sorting system. Then moving down, we have our brain stem, which is divided into three areas as well. But our brain stem is almost just involved with reflexive control. So for instance, going from top to bottom, we have our midbrain, which helps to control eye movements and relays our nuclei from our auditory and visual systems, helping with kind of eye reflexes. The pons participates in a lot of balance and posturing and also the regulation of breathing, those sorts of reflexes. And then our medulla, which also helps to regulate breathing, but also blood pressure, coordination of swallowing, coughing, vomiting reflexes, etc. So the brain stem mainly is involved with reflexive control. And then at the bottom here, we have our spinal cord. So the spinal cord is almost like a highway that just sends signals to where it needs to go in the body receives sensory information and then sends out our outputs. On the side here we have our cerebellum which does sit just above the brain stem and the cerebellum's main role is to help us have nice coordinated movements. So our actual movements are in the environment, moving our arms around, walking etc is nice and smooth. So it helps to really smooth out all of our motor movements. And then we also have our hypothalamus and our pituitary gland as well which are kind of these two little segments down the bottom here, which are mainly involved with homeostasis, so helping to maintain a normal internal environment, like regulating body temperature, food intake, hormonal control, etc. Now you may have seen that the cortex is actually divided into four different lobes, so the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. They're divided by their functions. 
which we'll go over throughout the rest of this chapter. As mentioned, it receives and processes all the sensory information and then integrates the motor functions. So it is the brain. You know, Just as you think about any brain, it receives all of the information, you think about it, then you decide what you're gonna do about it. The sensory and motor areas of the cortex are further differentiated into primary, secondary, or tertiary areas, depending on how directly they deal with processing. So clearly a primary motor cortex will directly activate the low motor neurons. Whereas a tertiary one has indirect control. It has a lot of other connections to go through, which helps it to have more complex processing to do more complex types of movements. And then we have association areas. And these just help to really integrate a lot of information into one type of action. Within the cerebral hemispheres, within our cortex, we also have these deep nuclei, like the basal ganglia, which helps to regulate our movements, similar to our cerebellum. We have our hippocampus and our amygdala, which are involved with the limbic system. More specifically, the hippocampus is actually involved in memory, whereas the amygdala is more involved with emotions and communicating with our autonomic nervous system that we talked about in the last chapter, sympathetic, parasympathetic supply, helping to have a little bit of control there. So that kind of summarizes our structure to our central nervous system. If we get down into more of a cellular level, we have two types of cells. We've got a neuron, which is specialized for actually receiving and sending signals. They are just a messenger. Whereas we also have glial cells, which are the support for the messages. They're the cells that are actually providing water and all the nutrients to those messenger neurons. So if we actually look at the structure of a neuron over here, you can see that we have several portions to it. So we have the cell body, which clearly contains all of the organelles to actually synthesize proteins that it needs for the neuron. So it has the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus within there, like a normal cell body in a normal cell. Off the cell body, we have these shorter, but more root-like structures called dendrites. Dendrites help to receive information. That's why they're all strandy like this, because they have multiple connections to other neurons that are coming in. So these are receiving sites of the neuron and they contain receptors. At the bottom here, we have this giant axon, which is just like an extremely large dendrite, but it's different, obviously. It's a very long projection, starting at the axon hillock and then terminating at a terminal or a synapse. So this is where our presynaptic terminal start. So we have a synapse and then it's connecting with another dendrite of another neuron. So the axon, this is where we have myelin wrapping around it to help insulate this region. Remember, we have gaps between the myelin called nodes of Ranvier because that helps to increase our velocity or increase our conduction velocity. We touched on this in the very first chapter, but the main difference here is that the axon compared to the dendrites, these are extremely long in, in comparison. For instance, we have one in our leg that goes all the way from our pelvis all the way down to your toes. So we have some very, very long axons that clearly need to be myelinated to increase the speed of conduction of an action potential. And then we have multiple types of glial cells. Remember, these are our supporting types of cells. And about half of the brain's volume is actually these glial cells, which help to provide the nutrients for our neurons. So astrocytes, these guys just do just about everything. So they supply the metabolic fuel, they synthesize neurotransmitters, they help to promote neuronal survival, modulate blood flow, and then maintain potassium concentration. So they are the main supporting cells. Astrocytes just keep neurons alive. Then we have oligodendrocytes, which help to synthesize the myelin for the axons that are within the central nervous system. Whereas Schwann cells actually synthesize the myelin in the peripheral nervous system. And then lastly here we have the microglial cells. And these guys are more involved with neuronal injury to help scavenger and remove any cellular debris. So they're more of the cleanup crew. So next we're just gonna talk about some very general features of the sensory and motor systems before actually diving deeper into those two separate systems which we'll talk about in the next video. So the first one is talking about synaptic relays. These are just some neurons or nuclei that help to just move a signal from one area to the other. They're very prominent in the thalamus, which is that sorting area of the brain because it helps to actually move those signals to where they need to go. But we can have relay nuclei in other regions as well, just purely trying to shuttle 
an action potential or a piece of information from one area to the next. Topographic organization is literally how that signal gets sent to the central nervous system. And what that means is that all of the sensations from all over your body keeps the layering from the body. And the best way that this is depicted is actually in this figure 312, which comes up later in this chapter. And as you can see, this is one slice through one area of the brain. And you can see that all of the different organs are next to each other, or all your different body parts. So you've got your intestines down the bottom here, your pharynx, and then you have your tongue, and then your chin, lips, all that area stays the same. And then you have your cheek, upper face, nose, and then you can see that your hand is all staying in the same and then all the way down to your foot. So you can see that the information that comes in from your hand all stays together. So your index finger is next to your middle finger, next to your ring finger, next to your little finger. So the signals from these two areas are going to stay next to each other as they travel up through your arm into your spinal cord. It's gonna travel next to each other in the spinal cord and then it be processed next to each other in the brain as well. And that describes topographic organization. Decusations just explains when a signal crosses from the left side to the right or from the right side to the left. And that happens commonly with both sensory and motor signals, but it doesn't happen every single time. As a general rule though, it's best just to think that it will happen. So all of the sensations from one side of your body actually gets processed on the other side. So for instance, sensations from your left hand actually gets processed on your right side. And then the outputs, so you, the movements in your left hand have been instructed to move from your right brain. That is decusations. And that is just a general rule. Once again, they don't always cross. And where they cross, whether it's in your spinal cord or brainstem, depends on that particular pathway, which we will be covering later on in the chapter as well. And then lastly here, we do have different types of nerve fibers. And they are differentiated really on their conduction velocity, which is determined on whether they're myelinated or whether they are large or small. So you can see we have two different classifications here. One involves both sensory and motor neurons, which includes A, B, and C. And you can see that the A's are the fastest, they're all myelinated, they're the largest. The B's are in the middle, they are the small ones that are myelinated. And then C, these are the slow ones, they're small and they're not myelinated. And they're involved with slow pain. Our other system, which is only sensory, we have more of a one to four system. Once again, one is the fast ones, the large ones, and they are myelinated whereas four is the slow, small ones which are unmyelinated. If you need to know this information, unfortunately the best way to learn this is just rote learning, so just go through this multiple times, write it out, and learn it if you need to. And that summarizes the end of the basics of the nervous system. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to drop a comment, otherwise we'll see you in the next video.